Follow the buzzer. Rest in peace. Welcome to the JM Report. I'm your host, Goro JM. This is episode 71, coming to you from CSB Studios in Tampa, Florida, the birthplace of pro wrestling. And it is post SummerSlam week, along with NXT TakeOver Toronto, which I'll cover the results here in a moment. But uh, <laughs> I, I usually try to find something else to open up with besides the obvious when I cover Raw and SmackDown and or pay-per-view. But uh, it, it will definitely tie in with uh, a character that made his debut this past Sunday. And the rumors immediately, almost overnight afterwards, about uh, it's, well, his, I should say, it's not a thing, but his limited uh, capacity or limited exposure. Anyone that has thought, why wasn't uh, The Fiend brought up on Monday and or SmackDown? Either a slight mention of his match with, with uh, Finn Balor. No uh, clips, no photo stills. Just no mention. Hell, not, not, not even a Firefly Funhouse episode this week. And almost immediately, some of these, quote, fans uh, jump to conclusions. When it's clearly, even the experts are saying, and I even knew right away what that, and I, I'm not claiming to be an expert, but bits and pieces of common sense still do exist in the world of pro wrestling, despite as many times as they, when it's convenient, use kayfabe. And when it's convenient to use, uh, like, oh yeah, don't you have this power? Don't you have that ability? Don't you have that authority? Which I'll get into as well later. But th there is such a thing, and I, I think they learned this the hard way long ago, as overexposure. Bray Wyatt, the fiend, he was already hyped up for months. And when he finally made his debut this past Sunday on, uh, at SummerSlam, he was all but the talk of the town for the rest of the night through Monday and Tuesday. And everyone trying to get a better look at that lantern. <laughs> and I, I took them as this, uh, just rumors, just people just talking out the wrong hole. And you must be new here. Or clearly have no indication, no, no bit of knowledge to more or less have a clue how the progressing world works. Do I know? No, but again, common sense does play a, a, a huge factor in this. And similar to Brock Lesnar, he's an attraction. Bray Wyatt probably hit gold this past Sunday with that Toronto reaction. And no one's going to say that he can't get the same reaction anywhere else in the States, let alone the world, that now he has become an attraction and will occasionally pop up when need be. He just needs to find a new opponent, a new prey, if you will. 
with that said, NXT TakeOver Toronto this past Saturday night. Five matches in all in about two and a half hours. I got to say the, the, the card overall was pretty good. I have to uh, retract some of my comments I've made last time about the NXT Women's Championship match. I thought I was, I thought I wanted to see Mia Yim get a, a better opportunity. The buildup was pretty good. Uh, the match itself, unfortunately, just you know, the pieces weren't falling into place, if that makes sense. And some lack of chemistry between the two of Shayna Baszler and Mia Yim. But let's go in order here. They open up with the NXT Tag Team Titles, the Street Profits, taking on the Undisputed Era of Bobby Fish and Kyle O'Reilly. <sighs> Words cannot describe what kind of match this was. You have to see it for yourself if you haven't already, but a lot of back and forth, a lot of near falls, a lot of false finishes. But at the end, the Street, Pro- uh, Street Profits, easy for me to say, retain the NXT Tag Team Titles. And they will have a rematch, these, t- these same two teams. Matter of fact, the uh, tapings took place this week and will air next week. And for those who are wondering, we, will, we now know a better idea after next week's NXT TV show, the fate of the NXT tag team titles when it comes to the Street Profits jumping back and forth between the NXT and the main rosters. Although they haven't made too many SmackDown appearances, but, you know, point being, they have been appearing on the main roster. Candice LeRae and Io Shirai, a bit of a grud match here. Io Shirai has, has changed into a full-fledged heel. Still adorable. But here was a chance for LeRae to shine a little bit more. And it's, it's kind of... Uh, I, I, you want to, at the same time, you don't want to make that comparison to Candice LeRae and Johnny Gargano. A lot of people will make that comparison because, well, they're a couple. You know how great Gargano is. Why can't LeRae shine just as much? Well, maybe she has. You just haven't seen it because the way Candice LeRae would express or show any kind of... Uh, Emotion in the ring, it could be under stress and the and the the pressure to perform at a high level as, as Johnny Gargano. But 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 I think that's unfair. You know, she's a great athlete on her own right. Even even before she met up and hooked up with uh, Johnny Gargano, and I think she she did great here. She sold really well between her and Io Shirai. Uh, had a great match, and of course Io Shirai pull out all the stops to make sure like you know stop cheering me i'm a bad guy i don't care <laughs> i don't care uh you know you cheer for me or not because i'm a bad guy well towards the end there was a spanish fly off the top rope by shirai and failed to pin her opponent resulting in a meltdown as uh showing frustration so shirai was still able to apply the the clutch the, the koji clutch that is forcing uh hennis larray unconscious and the referee to call for the bell so she never tapped out she passes out Lorray does giving the victory to Io Shirai again a great match here uh, I think the, some of the fans not all but I think some of the fans need to you know stop making that comparison why why isn't she as good as Johnny Gargano and all this and that's just complete nonsense she's great on on her own I doubt that they will create a mixed tag team match championship having a man and a woman defend uh, the same titles. But they'll be up there. And unless they have another intergender match and have these two go at it for a while to see who really is the better athlete, uh, no, they'll never do that. They'll never do this. And not not, not even in the video game uh, 2K20 that's coming out will they have that option. They used to, but it, that was long before 2K ever took over. But point being, lay off Candice LeRae. She's an amazing athlete on her own. She's a great wrestler and does not need to be, compa- uh, be compared to Johnny Gargano. Triple threat match for the North American Championship as the Velveteen Dream with the entrance of the night. <laughs> Bringing back the old uh, Mountie theme song. Taking on Pete Dunne and Roderick Strong representing the Undisputed Era. 
So unfortunately, after the first match of the first title match of the night, uh, the Undisputed Ever will not have all the titles at NXT. Oh well. In the end, the Dream I- executed the DVD onto Pete Dunne, but Strong tosses him out of the ring just in time to deliver the end of heartache. As this is going on, Strong believes he has the title in his grasp, but the Dream flew back into the ring, delivered an, an amazing elbow drop from the top rope onto Pete Dunne, and getting rid of Strong in the process to retain the title after he pinned Dunne for the three count. So Pete Dunne was just destroyed here at the end. Not one, but, but two finishing moves. And uh, the dream, that is, being quick and slick as he is, found a way to retain the title. Now, I'm a fan of, of the Rubber Team Dream. Kudos and, and, a, and a big accomplishment, if you think about it. I mean, not, not, not everyone thinks so, but if you're involved in a video game commercial, just like Velvet Team Dream was, alongside Stone Cold Steve Austin, alongside Hulk Hogan, who, who he's idolized for a very long time since he was a young child, to be in the same commercial, maybe not share the screen, but the same commercial. And I think it was about a year ago, Hogan even tweeted out and gave a shout out to Velvet Team Dream. I mean, this guy, is going places, and I, and I understand that Vince McMahon wants to have more involvement with NXT behind the scenes once uh, they, get, they get the uh, FS1 deal going later on this fall. I have concerns, yes, but because not all the cards are on the table just yet, I'm not going to chime in too much about it. Uh, I want to believe Vince will be involved more in a production side of things instead of uh, presentation and storyline because... He doesn't need that. He doesn't need to get involved with that. You know, I, I think everyone that's there now is doing a great job. I, I, Triple H is doing, has been doing an amazing job with NXT, so we don't need that. So if uh, Velveteen Dream has any thoughts or desires to go up to the main roster, I'll be a little careful. That's all I got to say, a little bit careful. Try to have some control over your character. I know it's not easy to do and something you earn right away or anytime soon matter of fact because Roman Reigns has really doesn't have much control over his his character he just goes out there and he he does what he's told and that's it but that that, that's not to say that Roman Reigns hasn't earned that position either so moving on for the NXT women's title Shayna Baszler taking on and defending against Mia Yim well the match itself, uh, <laughs> you see the effort. You see the uh, the passion in the match. But I just felt there were times where there wasn't too much chemistry. It, not, now, mind you, th- this wasn't throughout the match. It, it, it was as if it was on and off to me. Unless I missed something, maybe I, need, I needed to watch it again. But at first glance, uh, I don't know. There's, there was just something off to me. But in the end... Mia fought out out of the Baszler's attempted at at the clutch, targeting the the injured arm. She did and tried an armbar, but Baszler regained control. And this time, when Yim targeted the arm, Baszler trapped her in a triangle and tapped her out to retain the title. So Mia Yim goes down via submission. Just uh, another check mark next to the name of Shayna Baszler, of all the women she's had defeated in the NXT roster, including Io Shirai, including Candice LeRae, now Mia Yim. Who do they seem worthy of taking or removing the title off Shayna Baszler as the next women's champion? And in the main event, we had a two out of three falls match for the NXT championship as Adam Cole defended against Johnny Gargano. First match was a straight-up wrestling match. The second fall will be a street fight. And the third fall, if necessary, was revealed earlier in the night. And even if it wasn't, and if you missed it, I sure as hell realized, hey, they don't have the LED ring post, so that means the third fall has to be a steel cage match. But little did I know 
not only was it going to be a steel cage match, but it was going to be a steel cage match surrounded by weapons, topped off with razor wire on top where no one can escape. There had to be a winner inside the ring once and for all. And by the way, this was announced by NXT Commissioner William Regal. So in the first fall, Johnny Gargano got disqualified. As Adam Cole brought in a chair into the ring, using it as a decoy, waited until the referee removed it and then kicked Gargano low. It still only earned him a two count and Gargano utilized the chair, bashing Cole in the back, causing a disqualification. So at this point, Adam Cole is up 1-0. But some can argue, well, Johnny knew what he was doing. He knew the next fall was a street fight, so why wait? Sacrifice that one fall, which makes no sense, and just beat the crap out of him with the weapons in the street fight. They didn't always work. But in the second fall, uh, Cole is sent into a steel chair that was propped up between the turnbuckles and tapped out to the Gargano escape to win the second fall, Gargano. So we're even at one apiece. Here comes the barbed wire steel cage. As the officials and uh, ring crew adjust the, the cage and tie it down. What wasn't attached to this ring or the, or the steel cage, I should say, with the, uh, with the exception of a kitchen sink. But there was a lot of weapons attached to kendo sticks, sledgehammers, even a freaking fire extinguisher. And there was a, a table. People say it was a platform, but it was a table uh, inserted into the corner of, of the cage on top. But it served as a platform. Uh, for some reason, I, they colored it the same color as the cage. So both men are standing on top. Down below in the ring, there are two tables set up, one next to each other. At this point, the crowd is chanting, please don't die. And yes, don't do that. <laughs> Ever. So leading up to this spot, Gargano delivered a avalanche Canadian destroyer for a two count. Gargano produced a baggie filled with weapons, including a pair of pliers that he, he eventually did cut out a piece of the razor wire. And Adam Cole would climb up to the top of the structure. And this is where both men are standing on that platform. Gargano and Adam Cole grabbed each other. And they flew into the air, crashing through only one of the tables. Gargano looked like he got the worst of it as he landed flat on his back, Cole on his shoulder and hip. Cole had enough presence of mind to just get his arm and head over Gargano's body and get the three count, retaining the NXT championship. Of course, uh, after the ring was cleared out, they raised the cage, Adam Cole leaves. Out comes Candice LeRae to celebrate. Well, obviously not the victory, but the fact that uh, he survived, Gargano did. And fans started chanting, thank you, Johnny. Now, usually when they do this, there there will be a little rumor, a little noise somewhere, a little, little birdie talking that, well, that means that this person is going up to the main roster. Well, he had his opportunity... Early in the year, when he was the North American champion and teaming up with uh, a then NXT champion, Tomasa Ciampa. But, uh, Chima- uh, wow. <laughs> Ciampa went down with an injury and eventually needed surgery. So those, those plans were scrapped, and they kept uh, Ricochet and Alistair Black instead. Why did they find other replacements is beyond me, but I think uh, having more... TV exposure with some of the NXT top talent on Raw and or SmackDown was a great move, but it is what it is. So anywho, uh, Gargano celebrated with his uh, with his wife, got out of the ring, headed up to the rampway on stage. William Regal comes out and congratulates Gargano as well. Usually send-offs include Triple H. We didn't see that here. There wasn't any post-exclusive video of any kind, at least in the arena, as far as giving any any indication that Johnny Gargano was moving up to the main roster anytime soon. Now, I'm not saying personally it's a bad idea. I think it'll be a great addition. 
I think uh, Raw especially can use that boost there. SmackDown's doing great talent-wise. This wild card nonsense, you know, it's still keeping, it's, it's holding back others, but whatever. But time will tell. But rumors immediately almost started the next day about Gargano moving up to the main roster, and that's all I'm going to take it as rumors. Then we get to SummerSlam. Gulak will retain after delivering the Cyclone Crash and get the pinfall over Lorkin. But of course, a little sucker punch to the throat. <laughs> that would help out a lot as the referee did not see that. So Gulak retains the Cruiserweight Championship. Afterwards, we had a Apollo Crews Buddy Murphy match, which I thought was interesting. See, I, I like one day, which is rare, but when they have two opponents that are not involved with each other's storylines, it's just a random match. Some say it's a special uh, exhibition match or whatever. But to mix and match, in this case, a Cruz and Murphy, uh, it's potential there. Unfortunately, Apollo Cruz hasn't been pushed for a while. Uh, Murphy all of a sudden has been. Uh, getting involved with the storyline with Roman Reigns, Daniel Bryan, and Eric Rowan, which I'll talk about later. But all of a sudden, during the match, Eric Rowan, speaking of the devil, interfered and made this match a no contest, as apparently Rowan took exception to the comments made by Murphy the week before on SmackDown, calling him out as the one responsible, attacking Roman Reigns with a forklift and then later on with a car. So, uh... Yeah, you don't want to piss off a man the size of Eric Rowan and expect not to have repercussions later on. And Rowan just left him laying, Buddy Murphy, ringside, after delivering a spine buster to the steel post, well, the LED steel post, and walked away. In the final match of the kickoff show, women's tag team titles were defended by the new champions Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross, taking on former champions the Iconics, no automatic rematch clauses, right? But I guess it was on a kickoff, so it doesn't really count when it does. Anyway. Well, I don't know if they ever come up with a name for Bliss and Cross or Cross Bliss or Blissing Crossing with, with Alexa, Nikki. Well, who knows? So, Got to call them something. But they retain here against the Iconics. Really not much of a contest here as this was uh, enlightened. And uh, the highlight would be Alexa Bliss's outfit dressed up as Buzz Lightyear. And not much to this match. There were Twisted Bliss at the end, pin Payne Royce, and retain the titles. SummerSlam officially opened with the Raw Women's title as Becky Lynch defended against Natalia in a submission match. Both women would exchange hoes back and forth, disarmers, sharpshooters. But at the end, Natalia tapped out to the disarmer. And Becky Lynch will retain the Raw Women's title. In a good showing, uh, I, I think having a uh, one of the uh, hometown heroes, if you will, in this case Natalia, to get the crowd buzzing. But it's Canada, and... Although they were alive, the, uh, the, the crowd was, uh, they were very much alive throughout the night and awkwardly have uh, chants or responses to heels and baby faces, the complete opposite, I'm sure, what WWE was looking for. But Becky was booed at first and then cheered and chanted. Same thing with Natalia. And it's the reason why they call it Bizarro. But you know what? I think outside the U.S., uh, the Canadian fans, one of the best ones out there. And when they want to be vocal and they want to let you know that either you're great or you suck, they'll let you know without any hesit uh, hesitation whatsoever. Dolph Ziggler versus Goldberg. Match The match itself was less than a minute, but including the entrances, it was about three minutes. And I said uh, last time, uh, I'll be damned if this thing lasts more than five. But, you know, not bad halfway. But... Had a few surprise elements as both men were face to face. The bell rings and Ziggler immediately delivers not one but two super kicks, and Goldberg would kick out on both attempts. 
Ziggler was attempting yet another one from out of the corner, but this time Goldberg would deliver a spear, set up with a jackhammer, slams him down, and gets the win. Less than one minute. Ziggler would jump on the microphone, calling Goldberg a coward. Is that all you have? You don't have it in you anymore. So Goldberg comes back, delivers a couple of more spears, flattening poor Ziggler, laid out in the ring. And, well, thanks for coming, Goldberg and Ziggler. For the United States Championship, AJ Styles defends against Ricochet, as the OC was ringside for this. And having even fight them off towards the end, Ricochet did. He climbs to the top rope, tried to deliver. What was he trying to do? Wow. At first, I thought he was trying to do a, a 450. Then I thought he was going to do a uh, back moonsault. But, uh, oh my goodness. Well, basically, he backflips off the top rope, uh, swings around in midair to catch AJ Styles in a head scissor position. So I thought he was going to do, okay, a hero Karana. But instead, Styles catches him, puts on the brakes, and places him in the Styles Clash position and slams him face first into the ground to retain the title. I mean, even now trying to, to describe that, I, I got so tongue twisted. My mind was like, wait, what the hell? Like five things happened at once. Someone explained this to me. But the match itself was really good, despite the numerous interferences by the OC on the outside. But I thought it delivered what it needed to. And Styles retaining the U.S. title here. Uh, assuming, hoping this will be the end. But Monday Night Raw said otherwise. So we'll get to that. SmackDown Women's Championship match on the line as Bailey defended against Ember Moon. Ember fought out of a attempted uh, Bailey to belly, but she climbed to the top rope, and here comes Bailey once again and delivered a ba- Bailey to belly off the top rope and pinned and retained her women's title over Ember Moon. Now. Many have criticized the match. Hell, many have criticized the buildup. It was maybe less than two weeks. And there wasn't much shine on Ember Moon. She she lost every single match leading up to SummerSlam. No momentum whatsoever. It, it was all the focus on Charlotte with her match with Trish Stratus later on. And if that wasn't the case, all, all focus was on Natalia. Be, because. So... I'm not completely 100% convinced that uh, no one has any plans for Ember Moon moving forward other than just holding a spot in place of the women's division. But I'm getting there. And who knows when and where Ember Moon will get another push like this, especially now since we had a few uh, comebacks this week. And who knows, but you got to feel for Ember Moon just a little bit, and it really sucks. Kevin Owens taking on Shane McMahon. If Owens were to lose, he would quit WWE forever. Yeah, nothing's forever. But we will find out that Elias will play as the special enforcer on the outside of the ring. So after a couple of uh, distractions from Elias, even uh, preventing the referee from counting a pinfall, the inside referee gets distracted once again and Shane McMahon tries to separate them but he walks over to Kevin Owens who delivers a dick kick drops McMahon with a stunner and get the victory so Kevin Owens remains in the WWE and <laughs> I mean I mean this was a great entertaining match but we were all hoping that this would be the end of it but come Smackdown not so much Charlotte Flair taking on Trish Stratus in her last, last match ever. The last time she had a match was, what was it, 205? 205. 2005. (laughs) And uh, went out as the winner. Not not only as the winner, but she walked out with the women's championship at the time. Now, tradition would say anyone who's having the last match will be the one, they'll be the one who will be taking the pinfall. Looking up at the lights. And depending if your face would heal, the fans, whether they're aware of it or not, they'll reply in kind. And since Trish Stratus announced this to be her last, last match, 
I guess there's a difference between announcing your last match and announcing your retirement match. Anywho, surprisingly, not, well, the result not surprising, but the way it happened. Trish Stratus would tap out to the figure eight by Charlotte Flair. So now you got to ask the question, what's next for Charlotte? Obviously, she's on hold uh, getting back or regaining one of the women's titles. It would be, what, number nine, number ten? I'm not... I'm not sure if they're trying to intentionally break Ric Flair's record. And if anybody is going to break it, it will be his own daughter, which will make sense. Thankfully, it wasn't Cena, even though he's, quote, tied with it. But in reality, for those who don't know, Ric Flair won a lot more world championships outside the NWA, outside of WCW, and outside the WWE. So, And the irony is that WWE owns some of those video libraries. You know, they couldn't find it or they don't exist or the footage or matches themselves where Flair will win other championships outside of said promotions. It's just not available right now, but Flair has won more than 16 title matches or or 16 championships throughout his career. So yes, curious to see who and what is next for Charlotte Flair. Then we get into the WWE championship match as Kofi Kingston defends against Randy Orton. And as history shown between the two, stupid, 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 that being the way the match ended in a double countout. Both men stumbled to the outside right in front of Kingston's family. Orton would talk some smack. Kofi took exception. And he throws Orton into the ring post. The referee's counting. And by the time everybody realizes what's happening, the bell rings. So Kofi just attacks Orton with a steel chair. No, I'm sorry, with a kendo stick. Back in the ring, delivering the trouble in paradise. Yelling at Orton to get his bitch ass up. He doesn't. (laughs) And this ends the segment. This ends the match. It was a good match, but the ending I didn't like so much. But you know there's going to be a rematch more than likely, a night of champions for Randy Orton. Finn Balor, not as the demon, taking on the fiend, Bray Wyatt, making his reintroduction back to the WWE under a new... Well, it's still Bray Wyatt. It's just not Bray Wyatt has, let's say, uh, alter ego, similar to Mick Foley and the three faces of Foley. But this was probably the most hyped up anticipated match more so the entrance Bray Wyatt or the fiend was about to make his way to the ring the lights go out you you, you heard a little bit at the beginning of my show uh, part of his new hard rock remake song of uh, broken out of love and yeah hurt and heal But probably the most striking part of the entrance was the new lantern. A head lantern. Representing the old Bray Wyatt having his head stretched out just enough so they could stuff a lantern down his mouth or into his mouth. Making handles out of his uh, dreadlocks. (laughs) I'll talk about this a little bit more. (laughs) later on but yeah creepy as hell the music fit the lighting was there Uh, I would have chosen better camera angles in some spots but that's just me and the match was on the way and it was a different looking Bray Wyatt uh, as far as his um, traditional wrestling moves he was more aggressive more of a brawler Balor of course not sure at times what to do but he, he stuck in there delivering a couple of shotgun drop kicks, tried to deliver the coup de gras. But the fiend would counter into the manable claw. And Balor would uh, pass out. The referee would count to three. And the fiend wins his debut match. A lot more questions, but that's the whole point. Questions asked about the fiend. 
And you will want, definitely want to know what's next for him and who's next. No one's talking about championship matches anytime soon. It is, it is just that way too soon. But I'll say this much. If it doesn't happen until, let's say, WrestleMania. Now, The Fiend doesn't have to win the Royal Rumble to get a title shot at Mania. But putting that aside for a moment, just imagine if they played the, uh, the live, uh, who was it? Um, Code Orange, who now sings the new uh, remix version of Bray Wyatt's theme song. Imagine them live next year at WrestleMania at the Raymond James Stadium. I'm at, out here in Tampa, Florida, playing Bray Wyatt to the ring. He won't likely be in the same position like he was this night at SummerSlam, uh, second to the main event. He won it dark enough. That time of year out here in Tampa, the sun can stick around as far as 8, 8.30. That time of year, uh, 7 o'clock the latest. But it's all about timing because this time of year, the sun can stay out to like to 9 o'clock. Sun, sunset might be at 825, but that sun is still peaking from a distance. So, But enough about me and my weatherman report uh, <laughs> abilities. But, uh, yeah, it will definitely be a show stealer, just the entrance alone at a WrestleMania entrance for Bray Wyatt as the Fiend. And that's something I can't wait for. So in the main event for SummerSlam, Universal title, as Brock Lesnar defended against Seth Rollins, a bit of a, well, a huge difference between this match and the WrestleMania match that they had earlier in the year. And that once again, same, same result though, but once again, Rollins defeated Brock Lesnar to win back the Universal title after several curb stomps super kicks kicking out of not one but several f5s rollins was in it to win it and once again slayed the beast and seth rollins is your new universal champion so that's your nxt takeover toronto and SummerSlam results next up of course is night of champions but before we get there we will have a e w all out in a couple of weeks so stay tuned for that and a special preview in the coming weeks. Of course, all of this segues into Monday Night Raw, where Rollins opens up the show and reminding us that he slayed the beast, but he gets interrupted by the OC, but specifically AJ Styles, who challenges him to a champion versus champion match later on in the night. And we find out that the King of the Ring is returning starting this Monday night. And it's not a one-night show. It'll be stretched out in the next few weeks, leading up to the Night of Champions where the finals will take place. I will have the rundown of the participants representing Raw and SmackDown in a moment. We have a challenge match between Samoa Joe and Sami Zayn, who was caught talking trash about Joe backstage earlier on. Joe wasting no time slapping on the coquina clutch and choked out Sami Zayn. Joe's still a heel, folks. He's still a heel. The Miz versus Dolph Ziggler, as promised by the contract signing from the week before. Although Ziggler tried to get out of it, claiming that he was un- unclear, no, <laughs> he was medically unclear to compete as he uh, appeared here in his street clothes. But that was all just the rules as he attacks the Miz from behind and the bell rings and we get a proper match. So, similar to the night before, The Miz will tap out Ziggler to a figure four leg lock, of all things. Ziggler will get back on the microphone, calling The Miz a coward, that Maurice is a better wrestler. Miz will come back, deliver a skull-crushing finale, laying out Ziggler. Elias was set to perform in the ring and gave anyone who who was going to interrupt him a chance to do it now, not wait till later. He's waiting and waiting. So no one's going to interfere, no one's going to interrupt. And just as Elias begins to play, here comes Ricochet. And we get a match. There was a huge botch at the end here. Ricochet delivers a sunset flip off the top rope. He rolls up Elias back into the ring. 
And the camera clearly shows Elias' right shoulder off the canvas, but the referee counted the three regardless, giving Ricochet the win. I'm finding it more hard to believe that these botches are happening intentionally and that they will have a reason to address it the following week on Raw or into a pay-per-view for said individual to get a rematch or be justified given an opportunity to get the win back. We have a unnecessary two out of three falls match because, well, first of all, there was no commercial in between and the results speak for themselves. But Andrade took on Rey Mysterio. Andrade will win the first fall almost immediately after a distraction from Zelina Vega, rolling up Mysterio for the three count. And this segued right into the second fall, no commercial break, had a decent match. Mysterio goes for his frog splash, but Andrade brings up the knees. Mysterio crashed and burned, and Andrade delivered the hammerlock DDT to get the pin and win the second fall. So two straight falls, Mysterio falls. So why couldn't it just been a straight match? I, I mean, not that a two out of three falls match can't end after two straight falls, but and they they don't know what they're doing anymore. We finally get a one on one proper match between Drew McIntyre and Cedric Alexandra. Both of these men uh, complemented each other's styles, which I thought was great. But the big strong brute versus the high flyer, and at the end, it took just one wicked looking Claymore kick, literally knocking Cedric inside out, and McIntyre gets the win. No way Jose took on Robert Roode, the hometown hero. The match doesn't last too long as Robert Roode defeats No Way Jose with the glorious DDT. The Revival took on the Lucha House Party. You notice that uh, I'm not talking about much what's going on backstage because, uh, honestly, a lot of it was irrelevant and didn't add much to the show because we will see a lot of it uh, translate into their matches later on. So here, the Revival took it on the Lucha House Party on a normal tag team match. When all of a sudden, our truth starts running down with Carmella, Truth hits the ring, starts dancing with the Lucha House Party. Carmella trips Drake Maverick on the outside. Here comes the rest of the 24-7 roster. So the match gets thrown out. The Revival would then attack. <laughs> this was funny. Would attack R-Truth with the heart attack from the original Heart Foundation. And both members of the Revival pin and defeat Truth for the 24-7 title. So we have, for the first time ever, co-holders of the 24-7 title. Kalisto hits the ring and takes out Dawson, tries to pin him, but Wilder pulls him out of the ring and they brought on the outside. This allowed Carmella to sneak in and place over Dawson R-Truth to win back the 24-7 title and everyone scatters. So after the craziness inside the arena, we go backstage, R-Truth and Carmella are celebrating, but from behind came Elias smashing a guitar over or across our troops back, pins him, and now Elias is the new 24-7 champion. We get a recap of what happened or what's been happening with Roman Reigns between the forklift attack and the car accident or attempted murder of Roman Reigns. My only gripe about this is why is there a camera inside the car to try to hit Roman Reigns? And why was there a camera inside of Roman Reigns' car while the second car was trying to hit him? Kind of takes away the mystique, you know, if you're trying to keep it a mystery, like, who, who is it? Who is, oh, by the way, let's place a camera on this person's, inside this person's car that we don't know who's trying to attack and or kill Roman Reigns. You don't mind, do you? A mystery assailant or whatever we can call you right now. It's just so stupid. Natalia comes to the ring wearing an arm sling, selling the uh, disarmor from the night before at SummerSlam. And almost to the day, I think... Um, she was off by one day, matter of fact, the passing of her father. Uh, this past Tuesday marked the first anniversary of Jim DeAnvil Neihardt's passing. As she was discussing that, her father came to her in a dream. And before we could find out exactly what the exchange was, the return of Sasha Banks, interrupting Natalia's heartwarming uh, moment here. And clearly Sasha Banks wearing a obvious wig, long, very long-haired purple wig. 
She gets into the ring and embraces with Natalia, but immediately attacks Natalia and rips off the purple wig to reveal blue hair. Well, for those who've been following Sasha Banks on social media, you know she's been, I guess, experimenting, you could say, with different types of colored wigs. Uh, she even wore a, uh, it wasn't blonde, I was, it was what, what the term is, dirty blonde color, and said that was, you know, she looks like Natalia now. I, I, I don't know if that was a giveaway, but here she is attacking Natalia. So out comes Becky Lynch to make the save. Both men, uh, excuse me, exchanging wow. a brawl. I was surprised since even though Banks has shown that she's a full-fledged heel, but they didn't show any cowardness and stood her ground. And both women fought to the outside. Sasha Banks, uh, Sasha Banks gained the advantage after gaining and the, the advantage from a steel chair, the timekeeper's table, the, uh, time time, time and keepers table. attacks the back of Becky Lynch. And you couldn't see it first time around with these ridiculous seizure-looking angles at the camera. And there were two, by the way. They were cutting back and forth. You, you, didn't, you didn't really see the chair shots, but you know what was happening. Thankfully, there was a fan, if you go back and watch the original uh, live feed, but there was a fan sitting ringside, maybe two or three rows behind, and she had a clear shot of the chair attack. And one of the chair shots hit... Becky Lynch on top and back of her head. So if you go back, you notice that Becky immediately grabs the back of her head. That was because she caught a chair shot. But thankfully, there was there weren't any reports of concussions or severe injuries. So accidents do happen. And hopefully that should be okay. So we probably have a better idea of now who will be Becky's next feud with, leading into Night of Champions. The Viking Raiders took on a local tag team of uh, Carter Masson and Sebastian Suave, another squash and quick match. The women's tag team titles were once again defended. Back-to-back -back days, kudos, WWE. You, you, you remember that you have these things. Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross defend against the Kabuki Warriors, minus Paige, who had a uh, pre-recorded message to deliver to the fans that she was receiving neck surgery this week. It was very successful, by the way. It was a second neck surgery. And hoping after she heals and finishes up her physical therapy and rehab, I have a better idea or a better chance if Paige can return to in-ring competition. But right now, that's not the plan. The plan is for her to get as healthy as possible, not to strain or stress the neck anymore because she had a herniated disc in her neck that had to be repaired. And... This was her second surgery that, that had to require fusion. So most competitors, ask Steve Austin, ask uh, Edge, among other people that had would have the fusion neck surgery, Kurt Angle. They will return to the ring, but unfortunately, their careers were cut short. It's not something that's meant to last long. It's just meant to uh, fix the problem. And if, if you're constantly being dropped on the back of your neck, your back of your shoulders, and you're rolling, you know, basically rolling off your neck that way, that many times, night in and night out, you can't do that. I'm sure if Austin or Angle were limited, but those two guys in particular were so competitive, they didn't want to hear that. They wanted to be in the ring because they're badasses and they <laughs> had bills to pay. Things, uh, well, a lot of things have changed. Times have changed. Paige, more than likely, if she's clear to return, be, first her doctor's got to clear her, and then the WWE doctor's got to clear her. And if so, more than likely, Paige can be a part-timer, but still work a full-time schedule, if that makes sense. She just won't be in, involved in every show and every match. So here's the hoping, because the women's division could really use a fire up their ass right about now. But here, Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross, they retain or the tag team women's titles after delivering yet another brain buster twisted bliss combination onto Kyrie Sane. In the main event, champion versus champion as Seth Rollins took on AJ Styles. The, of course, the good brothers interfered as Luke Gallows tosses Rollins off the top rope, landing flat on his face in the ring. Referee got suspicious, realizing that Rollins was down and AJ Styles has been knocked out at this point. So who else could have done it? 
Then the Good Brothers, so he tries to toss him out. The match continues. Uh, Rollins would get back the advantage, but only to have the Good Brothers fly into the ring, cause a DQ, and there's a three-on-one attack onto Seth Rollins. But here comes Ricochet for the save. But then they get outnumbered. Then comes Braun Strowman. You haven't seen him in a while to even up the odds. So more than likely, we're going to get a six-man tag team match this coming week during the King of the Ring tournament in the first round as Universal Champion Seth Rollins, Braun Strowman, and Ricochet take on the entire OC. Kevin Owens opens up SmackDown, thinking that the feud with Shane McMahon is over, but here comes the money, and McMahon finds Kevin Owens $100,000 for attacking an official who was Elias, but of course, out of everything that was said, Kevin Owens never tried to defend himself and say, well, Elias is not an official referee, even if he was for one night, there was an argument there, but Shane, I'm sure, would have countered like, well, for that one night, he was. And asks for Shane to reconsider, but he says no. Uh, Owens ends up in Shane McMahon's office to, again, try to reconsider because you're taking food off the table, uh, the kids' uh, education and all that. So then Shane says something that I thought was like, are you serious? Out of all the times to bring that up, Shane McMahon was not there as a competitor. He was there uh, in an official capacity. Notice he never said what kind of title he has. Which uh, begs the, the question, then, what the hell was he there for in other previous times when he attacked Kevin Owens? I know it's kayfabe, but, you know, cut me some slack here. I'm, I'm trying to help them make sense out of all of, it, all of it, too. But all of a sudden, you're going to pull this power card out that Shane is now there on official capacity, not as a competitor. But it's okay to beat the crap out of Owens and other people on the roster for the for the past few weeks. Hell, the few months. So Owens couldn't get Shane to remove the fine. So Owens says, well, how about make it an even, what, what is it, 105000 So he picks up a bar stool chair and throws it against a flat screen TV that was hanging off the wall. And he just leaves. Of course, this leaves Shane McMahon smirking. As he has plans for a mystery opponent for him, for Kevin Owens that is, it ends up being Samoa Joe, and they will have a match later on in the night. Charlotte Flair and Ember Moon get no entrance here for their match, but it doesn't matter as Charlotte Flair makes Ember Moon tap out to the figure eight. Daniel Bryan and Eric Rowan appear on stage, denying all the actions that were taken against Roman Reigns. They are not the culprits, but doesn't blame Buddy Murphy either for exposing Rowan as the possible alleged attacker because of the tactics that Roman Reigns used in, in interrogating Buddy Murphy last week and spitting out the name of Rowan. So Brian and Rowan are going to look for Murphy later on in the night and try to get him to retract his statement and get an apology out of him. Okay, does Alistair Black show up at every arena and just locks himself up in these dark rooms and begs for someone to knock on the door? We've seen the locker room plenty of times, especially recently. Why can't he just stand up in front of the crowd and say, hey, who wants to challenge me to a match? I think mean, this, this whole mysterious dark place, it, it worked that the first time it worked and finally someone challenged them and ended up being Cesaro. Then what? You just go block yourself up again for someone else? To, oh, it's just getting re ridiculous at this point. It's overkill by now. And they just got to have Alistair Black go out there and wrestle already. He's one of the be best they have. And they got him locked up in a freaking broom closet. So for the first time since being drafted a SmackDown from 205 Live back in May, Buddy Murphy has his official in-ring SmackDown debut taking on Roman Reigns. A good showing despite having reports that Buddy Murphy was not ready for the main roster as he wanted to get bigger, as he wasn't the, one of the biggest cruiserweights he ever seen. But he falls in the hands or at the hands of Roman Reigns after delivering a spear and getting a three count. Samoa Joe takes on Kevin Owens. And Shane McMahon assigns yet again Elias as the special guest enforcer, despite giving Elias the time, the night off and that the 24-7 title will be lifted for the night. 
So after Owens delivers a pop-up powerbomb to Samoa Joe, which looked very impressive, Elias pulls out the in-ring referee. Owens gets distracted, gets in Elias' face, can't touch him. From behind, Owens gets rolled up by Samoa Joe, and Elias delivers the quickest three-count you've ever seen, so quick that you didn't even hear the smacking of the mat, but Elias screwed Kevin Owens, and he is left in distraught and heartbroken. As promised, Daniel Bryan and Eric Rowan run into Buddy Murphy in the men's locker room after they clear it out. And Bryan gets into Buddy Murphy's face, demanding that he renounce his uh, previous statements of Eric Rowan's involvement with Roman Reigns. So, it's funny here how Bryan and Rowan, well, more Bryan because Rowan didn't say a word, that he didn't blame Buddy Murphy first lashing out the name of Rowan because of the tactics that Roman Reigns pulled out last week. And here they are, except it's two-on-one, this the exact same tactics, pressing and pushing against Buddy Murphy's head against the wall. He agrees to take back the, his previous statements about Rowan, but he gets the snot beat out of him anyway in the locker room, and that's it. That's the end of the Buddy Murphy for the night. And in the main event, what was supposed to be a regular tag team match between the Revival taking on SmackDown Tag Team Champions, the, the New Day of Big E and Xavier Woods. Out comes Randy Orton instead, calling out uh, Kofi Kingston for being a coward and taking the coward's way out back at SummerSlam. So he changes it into a six-man tag team match as Randy Orton teamed up with the Revival to take on all members of the New Day. But at the end, Kofi Kingston, Big E, and Randy Orton are all outside the ring Back inside, the Revival delivered Shatter Machine to Xavier Woods to win the match. Kofi Kingston trying to make the save, but unfortunately he would eat an RKO from Randy Orton, leaving the WWE Champion laid out. And this segues back to the backstage area, where Roman Reigns confronts Daniel Bryan and Eric Rowan. Bryan demands an apology from Reigns, but says no word. So instead, Brian offers a new solution that they themselves have conducted their own investigation. They know who's been attacking Roman Reigns and we will find out who it is next week. So that's your Raw and SmackDown review for the week. A uh, bit interesting as both shows audience uh, ratings wise has gone up a little bit. And... I guess uh, you could say that that's placed us, the fans that is, in a in a in a spot where okay, where are you going with this next, with this story and that story, and that's the whole point. You got to draw in the fans. You create something. You create interest. You create enough noise where, well, there's got to be more to this, or you just can't finish it there. Because just to end things flat flat out like they did with Daniel Bryan's uh, career altering announcement or whatever the hell that was a couple of weeks ago just to have that script tore up and never make another acknowledgement of that again that's just i mean obviously it was poor writing enough for the old man to tear up the script not once but twice and back-to-back -back smackdowns and then i'm sure some of you have heard uh recent raw e events not money that raw itself but raw live house show events being canceled No one really knows the the exact reason why, I would imagine. Well, maybe it's money saving, maybe, or there weren't that many ticket sales. Usually that's the answer. You know what? At the end of the day, including myself, no one can complain too much about this because they're still making money. And they exactly, they are in a position where they can afford, they can afford to cancel as, as many shows as they want. Of course, as long as it's being uh, house shows, pay-per-views, not so much because, you know, they'll reschedule that. So they're in a good place, WWE financially. But moving on, the King of the Ring tournament is coming back for the first time in four years. And it will go across multiple shows leading up to the Night of Champions where the finals will take place. Excuse me, the Clash of Champions. No, jeez. It's not Night of Champions anymore. It's not even 
Clash of the Champions. It's just simply Clash of Champions. Right, because, you know, people are better at literature than others, I guess. Anyway, so this week on Raw coming up, we'll kick off the first round. Leading uh, on both Raw and SmackDown, matter of fact. The second round will take place next week on August 26th and August 27th, Raw and SmackDown, respectively. The semifinals will take place on September 9th and September 10th on Raw and SmackDown, respectively. Both out of Madison Square Garden, so that should be a good show. Both of them, matter of fact, should be good shows. And the finals themselves taking place on September 15th on the pay-per-view Clash of Champions out of Charlotte, North Carolina. Interesting location. So we now know who will compete. We now know who will represent Raw and SmackDown as Ali, Andrade, Apollo Crews, Baron Corbin makes his return, Buddy Murphy, Cedric Alexandra, Cesaro, Chad Gable, Drew McIntyre, Elias, Kevin Owens, The Miz, Ricochet, Sami Zayn, Samoa Joe, and Shelton Benjamin. Some of these names have not been seen on TV, at least not in in-ring capacity, for a very long time. So it would be very interesting not only to see how they're handled and used, and if, for example, someone like a Chad Gable or Shelton Benjamin, even if they don't win the, the actual tournament. But for me, I'll be shocked if they make it past the first round. And for you history buffs, the last person to win the King of the Ring was Bad News Barrett back in 2015. So the hope is here that something comes out of this. You just don't have or bring back an old concept like this that is not a pay-per-view anymore and not expect for the winner to receive at least an opportunity at a championship or some kind of, uh, you know, well, at least to keep them important. Something like that. If, if it's not a title match, then they draw number uh, 30 for the Royal Rumble the following year. Something. So I talked about before Bray Wyatt not being seen on television this week, let alone mentioned, but that adds more to the mystique of the character because you don't want to overdo this. You don't want to overexpose a character like this because WWE, not all the time, but they know here in this, in this case, Bray Wyatt as the Fiend is something special. So, he is scheduled to make appearances at upcoming Raw house shows. Not the ones that are canceled, obviously. But he will be on Raw this coming week, as advertised, from uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. This is a very important episode because it's also the same night as King of the Ring. As uh, Bray Wyatt is, is also advertised for August 26th at the Smoothie King Center in New Orleans, Louisiana. Now, the Head Lantern. There's a huge dispute, and all I've heard were rumors, mostly on Twitter. And one that caught my eye is, uh, well, Mattel's going to have a hard decision to, to, uh, to make because this Head Lantern looks uh, too creepy to make a toy out of. And, of course, there was a lot of uh, com comparisons to Al Snow's situation during the Attitude Era when uh, his action figure was uh, pulled. Because one, one woman made a claim that his action figure looked like he was walking around with a severed head. Not realizing the fact that it was a mannequin head, but because they're toys, you can't really tell the difference. Especially one who's never followed or seen uh, WWF at the time. So, the, the decision back then was made to pull all Al Snow action figures that carry the mannequin head. And they compromised by giving them weapons, such as shovels and chairs and tables and all that. But then again, the hardcore title was a thing back then. So, uh, replace one blunt object with others. Thanks, Parents of America. But here's the thing. The age group or the target audience at the time who were attending high school, which I was, we're talking 90s, 95, 96, into 97. Those uh, young people, let's call them, they're grown up now. They're about my age today. And most, if not 
the majority of them are parents themselves now. And what I think would be hypo- uh, hypocritical, that if these grown-up people who are now parents themselves would turn around and say, well, this head lantern would be too creepy and, and scare off kids, and you can't sell it as a toy. I get the argument. I understand why you would make the claim that it looks too creepy. It's a severed head with a lantern shoved in its mouth. I get it. Unlike some comedians who didn't get it, but that's another story. I just hope it's not the same kids that are growing up to be parents today that are making that claim. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, would make that claim. Let me rephrase. No claim is made yet, other than one person making that comment that Mattel might have a a difficult time to decide. Well, 2K Games doesn't seem to have that decision to make because The Fiend is not going to be a new downloadable character for the upcoming 2K20 game. Though we have not seen any video game footage, but it's believed at this point that Bray Wyatt would have the Head Lantern involved and in the video game. What's happened since SummerSlam, especially on YouTube and probably across the rest of WWE social media, during the entrance of The Fiend, it's edited where you don't see the head lantern at all. There were a couple of close-ups, especially when he placed it on the apron, but that's where it cuts away. So maybe, possibly, this may be a vi- in violation to their PG or TV PG uh, rating. Who knows? But it's the freaking internet. What rating system is on the internet? Mind you, a lot of websites do have policies in place that you can't pass a certain limit as far as, uh, you know, too much is too much exposure of of a video showing nudity, for example. You can't show that. And if you do, it has to be censored or edited. That That's in play. But it's, it's just... Uh, A huge deal being made so far, and a lot of experts haven't chimed in yet. But for me, this all started when that comment was made about Mattel. You do know they've made zombie figures of WWE wrestlers where their skins are being peeled off. Certain limbs are split open. You can see meat and bone. As graphic, quote unquote, as the head lantern was for the fiend. Where is the meat? Where is the blood? The handle is made out of his freaking dreadlocks for crying out loud. People need to chill. And if it's going to be a toy, then it is a toy. Because these things were not available growing up unless you are following uh, McFarlane who created those Spawn uh, action figures, and then he ventured out into uh, other movie characters, such as Candyman, Freddy Krueger, Jason, all them guys, which I used to collect a lot of in storage now. And they would die-cast detailed figures of all their scars, all their cuts, and yeah, you can see internal organs. I, I don't ever recall being a rating system for toys, Mind you, I understand you if you're a parent, you don't want to expose your children to that. Fine. You're doing a great job as a parent. And and I'm not saying that to be sarcastic. I think a line needs to be drawn to where what a parent thinks their child should be exposed to seeing or be in possession of in this case. But it will be a tremendous misunderstanding. And the irony here is that the head lantern is a decapitated head of the old Bray Wyatt, or at least it's supposed to represent that, with a lantern shoved in his mouth. And if that's the mix or negative message that parents are trying not to get through their kids, then then I'll say, okay, do not make a toy out of it. That first toy, that first line of the Fiend action figure, you know that's going to sell out everywhere, especially pre-orders. Hell, they'll be in back order. I'll be lucky if I get my hand on one of them. You thought the the Demon Finn Balor first ever action figure was was a was a sellout, or was sell like hotcakes? This one will be no different. If anything, will probably surpass those sales. But 
for once, uh, uh, all of us, a lot of us, let's get our heads out of our asses and think logical about this. And times have changed. It's been 20-something years since the Al Snow action figure nonsense occurred and how much money that was taken out of his pocket, if you think about it. You know, it's a business now. It's always have been. But when it comes to the, the relationship between, in this case, WWE and Mattel, no longer Jack specific, because I could have sworn there were a lot of young people at SummerSlam in the audience cheering for this, whether uh, whether the head lantern was shown on the big screens of the arena, I'm not sure. It sure as hell was not seen on the Titantron, but a lot of people made a lot of noise about it, saying that it was, yeah, creepy, unexpected, far cries from like, no, don't make a tour out of that, just relax. That's all I got to say. It's just freaking relax. According to the Staples Center's website for their SmackDown debut on Fox, this will be all, <laughs> all hands on deck for WWE as they're trying to stack this debut show as much as possible. For both Raw and SmackDown will be in attendance for the SmackDown show, that being of the main rosters. And already advertised, and card is subject to change, but the New Day, all three members, will take on Randy Orton, Daniel Bryan, and Rowan. Roman Reigns will take on Samoa Joe. Brock Lesnar will appear on SmackDown. SmackDown Women's Champion Bayley will be there. And a few legends. And, and here's the thing, this, this whole year has been nothing about legends returning, and we've seen a lot of it. This year, putting aside the Hall of Fame show, we had the Raw reunion. We had Goldberg returning to face The Undertaker in Parts Unknown. This past weekend, Goldberg returning yet again, uh, along with Trish Stratus. So there's been nothing but legends returning this entire year. And the debut show on Fox for SmackDown will be no different because they're li- they're, they've listed on the website of uh, Staples Center, they've listed the return of several Legends and Hall of Famers such as Kurt Angle, Lita, Mick Foley, Booker T, Hulk Hogan, Trish Stratus, Goldberg, Jerry Lawler, Mark Henry, Ric Flair, and Sting. And more is yet to be announced. Uh, Kurt Angle will be setting up a meet and greet. They'll be available while supplies last. So if you haven't already, look into that from the Staples Centers and also WWE.com. Curious to see that Sting has been added to this list again, even though he was advertised for the Raw reunion, but never showed up, along with Sid Vicious, but, you know, hey, but Sting? I mean, it's it's not that I wouldn't want to see him, but what exactly is his connection to the anniversary of SmackDown? But I guess since everybody's under the WWE umbrella, who cares? Mentioned Paige earlier having successful neck surgery. She posted updates on our social media. Paige having a second procedure to her neck, for a herniated disc sustaining from a career-ending match that she had in a women's tag team match in Uniondale, New York. Of course, that being in Long Island, for those who don't remember. And it's still available on YouTube where she was drop-kicked in the back between her shoulder blades and the bottom of her neck by Sasha Banks. It's just um, It was just a fortunate accident. The whiplash effect was more than her body could endure. And it just caused the injury. But hopefully, uh, hopefully, we'll have better results and a better outcome in the near future. What an out page does return to the ring. Dave Meltzer has reported that the WWE is in talks with CMLL, the promotion out of Mexico. According to the report by Meltzer, that Sofia Alonso who took over her father and the promotion after he passed away of Mr. Paco uh, last month. The WWE reached out to the company for discussions. Paco, the original promoter who operated CMLL, dated way back to 1987. And he has broken relationships with uh, New Japan, Ring of Honor, Rev Pro, just to name a few under his watch as promoter of CMLL. Curious to see how this particular 
negotiation goes through. Maybe be a, a talent exchange. I don't know how far WWE would go as far as obtaining the video library, which would be a huge boost for their network, which is still reamping, by the way. They, they did their, up, their, their massive update. There were a lot of features that were taken out, but they're coming back slowly. Uh, it was curious to see that they removed, um, oh my God, what's it called? Uh, Hidden Gems. And this week alone, I think it was earlier this week, they just put it back. But as far as the WWE relationship or possible future working relationship with CMLL, uh, we'll see. I personally am curious to see how it will work out. Again, possible talent exchanges, possible um, interpromotional matches, maybe not in the States. But if they do have one out there in Mexico, they can definitely have broadcast that live event on the, on the network. I mean, that will be so beneficial for everybody. Meltzer also reported on the mysterious disappearance of the Usos. Of course, that's an exaggeration on my part. But because of Jimmy Uso's DUI arrest a couple of weeks ago, this banned him from crossing borders into Canada. And, of course, Jay decided not to travel with him as well. So what's the point of having one Uso when you could have both? So the charge still stands. And right now, the Usos are being kept off television. Because they were in Canada still, WWE. So once they're back in the States next week, might be a different story. There was a rumor about Dolph Ziggler asking for his release. That was all untrue. According to the rumor, Vince McMahon broke the deal. And would not be letting Ziggler out of his deal contract under no circumstances whatsoever. But according to Dave Meltzer, he claims that the rumor is not true in the slightest. Whether or not this ends up being true is still undecided, but it does seem as if Ziggler is sticking around with the WWE for a while as there are no plans on wanting him to work out of his deal anytime soon. So, Melissa thinks it's bullshit. Me, personally, I think if they're not planning to, to have huge plans with the guy, I mean, the whole Drew McIntyre and Bobby Lashley deal, it looked like it was going to work in the beginning, but then... I think Ziggler's better off on his own. Or maybe in some kind of surprise move, have Ziggler join the OC. I, I don't think uh, Vince McMahon or anyone in WWE owns the uh, trademarks to the Bullet Club. But they could definitely have their own version of it. They tried with the club before. It didn't really go anywhere. They broken up. They, they were broken up so fast as, as quickly as they put them together. So now that they're back together... Looks like they're going to stick around a little bit longer than anticipated as the OC, but adding another member like Dolph, Dolph Ziggler, I say, you know, what can go wrong? <laughs> At least then you can have fresh matches, and especially when the time comes to break them up and you have Ziggler against AJ Styles. I don't think we've seen that match yet, have we? I, I'm getting old. Goldberg sat down with Booker T for his podcast, and they discussed what happened, what went wrong during his match with The Undertaker at Super Showdown. Well, in short, it was just an opportunity for Goldberg that he want, did not want to pass on to work with The Undertaker, a man that he's never had a match with before. They had a bit of a face-off a couple of years ago at the Royal Rumble, but that didn't go anywhere up, up until many years later, uh, just a few months ago, This, a uh, matter of fact, early in the summer. And was told even then, uh, in a very short amount of time, a couple of weeks later for SummerSlam, that you had a match with Dolph Ziggler coming up in Canada. So, of course, Goldberg does mention the head injury, but doesn't mention about a concussion or any other se uh, severe damage to his temple, to, to his uh, head. And he said that the spot, the spot where he, he misses the spear and hits the ring post, that was his idea. And, of course, every single time, or at least most, most of the times, he's hit or speared the ring post, he would, do some, he would do some damage to his head. And this time it split him wide open. He, he leaves out the part where he was dropped on his head by The Undertaker. Of course, by that time, both men were exhausted. So, yeah, he's not looking for excuses. He's, he's not trying to give excuses. He's actually talking about what happened. Uh, of course, everybody assumed that the match with Ziggler was to make up 
for that horrible outing, for that delivery. Uh, yes and no, but but it's against freaking Dolph Ziggler. And no disrespect to Dolph Ziggler, but he hasn't been in the main event for who knows how many years now. You know, had it been, you know, I don't know, Daniel Bryan, and, uh, a main eventer, but then again, he's been out of the spotlight since WrestleMania. But an actual threat, an actual physical uh, presence of a big man versus Goldberg. Maybe a Drew McIntyre, but do you really want to kill off McIntyre like that? Maybe in a special uh, exhibition, have Goldberg take on Big E or something. Who knows? But Taker at least had his chance to make up for his match, but it was a tag team match teaming up with Roman Reigns. Goldberg's uh, opportunity at it less than a couple of weeks later, not so much. I mean, that's just me. I, I think they could have found a better opponent for him. Samoa Joe, maybe. But Joe, Joe might be winning a lot of matches, but what, what is really his angle right now? What's what's his uh, feud? Who, who's his feud with right now? He but dropped Roman Reigns. Oh, he apologized? Okay, but, you know, I still hate you people. <laughs> Deadline.com has reported that Dave Batista will produce and star in the film called Trap House. Along with creator of the Fast and the Furious, Gray Scott Thompson is writing the script. And it will follow an undercover uh, DEA agent and his partner who embark on the game of cat and mouse. No word when exactly this movie will be in production or a release date was mentioned. Title Match Wrestling has announced that Renee Michelle, wife of Drake Maverick, will be appearing at the upcoming Ladies Night Out on August 17th, as this will mark her first independent booking since appearing on Monday Night Raw at the World Gym Arena in Texas City, Texas. John Moxley was unable to win the New Japan Pro Wrestling G1 Climax. However, he may have an opportunity at the IWGP United States Championship versus Juice Robinson. It's been speculated that the third bout of their trilogy with one another will take place at New Japan's annual Tokyo Dome on January 4th of 2020. Of course, he's still under contract with AEW, and they have their TV show debuting this coming October. Curious to see if they will have uh, interpromotional, if not interpromotional matches, then the acknowledgement, let's say Moxley wins the United States Championship in New Japan, if not appear with the title, can they at least announce that he is the IWGP United States Champion? Time will tell. Roman Reigns has announced that he has signed a new multi-year deal contract with the WWE. Really no surprise there, but I just wasn't aware that his contract was coming up for expiration. But since he's had a taste of Hollywood, and I know I may mention here a couple of weeks ago that he'd rather stick to wrestling and maybe go back to it after the fact, but he has opportunities. So maybe that they're being presented, maybe they're being offered. Even though he wasn't at SummerSlam, we did see him on SmackDown, but doesn't mean that the man is not out there trying to pursue or expand on his uh, career a little bit and maybe venture out into other territories, maybe cameos on, on TV shows, hosting a TV show. Who knows? But it's possible. And with the influence from his cousin putting the word out there that Roman Reigns, hey, he's a big, good-looking guy. How about giving an opportunity for this project or that project and go for it and see what happens. Now, I'm not going to spoil anything here, but the next NXT TV show is full of surprises. And I'll leave it at that. And it'll definitely answer one of the questions as far as what's been happening with a, uh, well, particular talents. And what's going on with them? What will go? What what will happen to them? And tune in next week. I'll end with this because I felt that there weren't too many uh, headlining news to discuss here and share with you guys. But Matt Riddle sat down during the SummerSlam watch along, and he shared apparently a 
confrontation that he had with Goldberg backstage right before he got to that uh, couch with the uh, watch along. So rather than me read his quote, um, let's hear it from the man himself. And I'll, I'll end the show there, but I'll just say this. Even though it's uh, it was advertised and shown on WWE social media, such as YouTube, surprisingly, and it's even the, the, the title itself, the categories like Matt Riddle and Goldberg. Of course, these guys have exchanged uh, a bit of words on Twitter. Riddle's not much of a fan of Goldberg, not spe- specifically his wrestling capabilities. So in short, to see a wrestling match between Matt Riddle and Goldberg in WWE anytime soon, I'm going to say it's highly unlikely. I'm not saying it's not impossible. But because they're having a war of words, I mean, we've seen this before, and they tried having these guys, you know, both uh, robberies, uh, uh, finish it off in the ring, but it didn't go anywhere. Not to mention, besides the, the fans getting satisfied, the company itself, what do they benefit off of? You know, especially if it's a one-off, they don't celebrate one-offs too many times. And if they do, then it's expanded into a year or, or two. And uh, Well, again, th- thank you all for listening. This is good old JM. I'll leave you in the words with uh, Matt Riddle here. Till next time, everyone, behave and be good. So, William, I'm walking by and I see his locker room. I've already seen Brock's, but I see Goldberg's locker room. And I'm like, I'm trying to get a peek. And I'm looking, I'm looking, all of a sudden, pow! Big shoulder, 300 pounds at least. I look up, it's Bill Goldberg. I'm like, Bill Goldberg. He goes, oh, we got some talking to do. And I'm like, well, we can talk anytime, bro. He's like, yeah? And I'm like, yeah. And then he's like, and I was like, all right, bro. Well, anytime. He's like, I'm not your bro. And I'm like, all right, bro. Like, take it easy. Whatever. And then he's like, yeah, we'll see. I'll see you later. And I was like, and hey, it was a pleasure meeting you. I go, the pleasure was all mine, bro. And then he goes, I'm not your bro. And then I walked away and I had I had to come here. I found the strength to open my eyes.